I want to read you something out of Exodus. In Exodus 15, it says, And then Moses said to the Israelites, Sing to the Lord, sing a song to the Lord. I told my eye doctor I refuse to get bifocal, so this is what I have to do. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and the rider and its chariots he threw into the sea. Listen to this. They, they sang, The Lord is my strength and my song and he has become my salvation this is my god and i will praise him my father's god and i will exalt him the lord is a man of war the lord is his name as i was thinking about that they did that at the other end of the red sea they had the opportunity to do it at the at the beginning but they made a decision to do it after they saw the mighty works of god and we are in that same place we can praise God when we've been through it, or we can praise Him when we're going through it. So we can run through the Red Sea hoping it doesn't fall on us, or we can dance through the Red Sea. You decide, right? God is still going to use His power. So let's be the people that we don't have to wait to see till we get to the other side, but we enjoy the journey, we enjoy our way through it, that we say He's a mighty man of war before a single drop of water splits. Amen? Father, we thank you that your goodness is over us, and we lift you up in this house in Jesus' name. Let's give him glory, church.
understand me Come to me in the valley of unknown You understand me You understand me You understand me, God understand me so I'll throw all my cares before you my doubts and fears don't scare you you're bigger than I thought you were you're bigger than I thought so I stop all negotiations with the God of all creation you're big facing today is going to be too big for the God that's way bigger than we ever thought he was. But I've got news for you today that not only is he bigger than your biggest problem, but he cares about your smallest problem too. Nothing that you're ever going to bring to him, no matter how small, big, 
big it is, nothing you're ever going to bring to him is going to overwhelm him because you weren't meant to be stressed out. You weren't meant to live a life in worry. You were meant to give that over to God, to rest in his arms today. Just rest in how good Jesus is. Rest in how good your father is. Thank you, Jesus. Isn't he good this morning? Thank you, Father. We are so glad whether you chose to walk through those doors this morning or whether you chose to click watch online, you became part of our family this morning and we're so glad that you did. So if you would, however you feel comfortable and respecting the person next to you, turn and greet them and tell them how happy you are that they're part of our family today. Thank you, Jesus. Okay, welcome to Metroplex Family Church. So glad you're here on this beautiful day. This is the day the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for all of that y'all are here. And uh, bless your heart. Everybody's sitting on both sides of the auditorium. For those that are watching, you can't see that. So you're like, where is everybody? We've got some people traveling this weekend, enjoying this beautiful weather. And I'm so thankful for the weather. I don't know about you. I, I, I enjoy spring in Texas. I do not enjoy summer in Texas, but I enjoy spring and fall, and we're going to make the most of it in Jesus' name. Again, I want to welcome those that are watching us on MetroplexFamilyChurch.com or Facebook, especially some of you that are driving and traveling today and working hard. We appreciate them watching. Let's give those people a hand. Uh, we've got some people that are... Um, that are actually working, and they're not being distracted from their job, but they're, they're listening to us, and uh, it's awesome. I mean, again, America and our society now that seven days a week is seven days a week. Sometimes people are working every day, and so especially those in the medical community. And for those that drive trucks, I don't know about you, those are real heroes, are they not, with our first responders? And we have several of those that are tuning in today. So anyway, let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. Thank you so much for this beautiful day. This is the day that you have made, and we rejoice and we are glad. And Lord, I just thank you for every person here. And I'm just inviting your presence, Lord, to minister not only through me, but to each one of us and to us individually. And we just welcome your absolute 
Holy Spirit to move among us. Lord, I thank you for revelation of the Word of God, and I thank you so much for showing us what you want us to hear and see. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. If you've got a Bible today, let's open it to Acts chapter 1 or look on the screens with me. I'm in a series called The Acts of the Holy Spirit. And again, if you have a Bible like mine or seen a Bible like mine, it says The Acts of the Apostles written there on the top of the page. And you know, that's okay, but it's really not the truth. It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit not the Acts of the Apostles. I think sometimes we, we look at the book of Acts, especially coming out of Jesus' resurrection situation, and we think, well, you know, these were supernatural events that happened then, and look at all these people and things that happened to them, and they were of a special time and a special generation. Well, that's not true. We're all special in God's eyes, and we can operate and live in the functions of the supernatural, especially a relationship with the Holy Spirit, which I want to talk about today for the next couple of minutes, just like these people did. And I think the book of Acts sometimes is looked at as a historical book instead of a book of application. And I'm a person to look at a book as not just an application as far as, you know, to, to the fact that I look at it, we can apply it right here and right now, that I'm inspired by the accounts of these people. And again, I, I think there's some things that are very important here. First of all, before we go to Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 4, I've got some things I want to share with you about the book of Acts. And I'd like to sum it up like this. God gave Jesus, according to John three sixteen, 16, uh, God gave Jesus, but then Jesus gave you and I the Holy Spirit. And I think that's so beautiful that God walked among us through Jesus. Then all of a sudden, when Jesus came and he was on the ministry, uh, his ministry three years, three and a half years, 33 years on the earth, then he descends into heaven. He gives us not only to God to live among us like Jesus did, but to live inside of you and I. I think that's fascinating. All the gods in the world that people, you know, bow down to and claim that is God, we're the only one that has the God that actually comes to live inside. I think that's beautiful. Anyway, so God gave us Jesus, but Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit. Let's look at these real quick, these things I've shared about the book of Acts. Um, they're just facts that I've written out. Maybe uh, they'll help you to understand. First of all, let's look at it and see that the, it's the last recorded words of Jesus. So the acts of the Holy Spirit are not the acts of the apostles. And I want to make that clear from my point of view. I know that the, your Bible says that, but it's the acts of the Holy Spirit. We're not here to glorify men. We're here to glorify the Lord, right? Notice the next thing. The, the, acts, the, book, the, the book of Acts theme is in Acts 1.8. Let's read that together. It says, Jesus said, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of mine in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You can say it like this. When and you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. You shall be my witnesses in uh, Johnson County, Tarrant County, Texas, America, around the world. So that's the way that's applicable to you and I. But notice what it says, you shall receive power. Everybody say power. power. Notice what it says, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. But let's go back to that list. We're going to get to that in just a second. It says the, the book of Acts, notice what it says, the first 12 chapters, the major figure is Peter. I think that's interesting because Peter, you know, <laughs> he was a classic guy that put his foot in his mouth. I mean, he's bold one minute, and uh, then the next minute he's running. And then in the book of Acts, he's a completely transformed man. He stays consistent in his boldness. And the first 12 chapters are basically he's the major figure. Then next you'll see the last or the, the next chapters, or there's, excuse me, this, there's the final six. 16 or about the Apostle Paul. And I think that what's interesting about the Apostle Paul is he never knew Jesus as far as he was not in a physical relationship with Jesus. Yes, Jesus appeared to him on the road to Damascus, but the situation was it was a supernatural visitation. Even though Paul lived during the time of Jesus, he would, they never encountered each other. And it was till after Jesus resurrected that he had this encounter with Paul. And then finally, they call it, there's the 30 years, the first 30 years of what we call the church age. That's the book of Acts. It's the first 30 years of where we are today. And then finally, the book of Acts records three missionary journeys of Paul, which are fascinating, which really is the foundation that gets the gospel starting to go out throughout all the world. And that's the, the seed of what we have right now. As a matter of fact, those missionary journeys of Paul is what brought the gospel eventually to where we are today, right here in the great United States of America. You'll notice some other things about the uh, book of Acts. It says the ministry of Jesus was supernatural in the four gospels, but the acts of the Holy Spirit is supernatural through the entire book of Acts. I mean, every chapter there is a supernatural thing happening. Isn't that awesome? I mean, supernatural. 
not just natural. And then the next thing is, uh, I like this too, it says that the Holy Spirit is recorded in every single book, every single chapter in the book of Acts. There is a supernatural moving of God's Spirit. Well, again, what are you saying, Pastor Brown? Well, I just want to let you know that has not stopped. That has not ended, and it's not been placed away and put under a, you know, a rock and say, hey, that was for a generation that you know, I can't relate to because you know, Paul didn't have a cell phone, he didn't have an iPad, and he didn't have Facebook. But you know what? He had the Holy Spirit, and he had a life that's worth looking at. They had lives that, where they had to deal with persecution too. I mean, not everything was rosy and everything was happy. As a matter of fact, the, the main theme throughout this book concerning what they had to deal with was persecution. I mean, they had to stand up for what they believe. And I know a lot of you have expressed to me, you know, what about all this happening politically and all these kind of things? What about, you know, persecution as far as Christians and what they believe? Well, I understand all that, but these people also dealt with it. But they dealt with it not within themselves. They dealt with it not in politics. They dealt with it in the power of the presence of God within them. And that is the difference to me that just sets them apart and sets up you and I apart compared to people of the world. And look at the next thing. I like this. This is my own deal. I have to pat myself on the back. The next thing, talking about the themes of the, whole, of the book of Acts. Check this out. I think this is pretty good. I wrote this myself. I didn't get it from anybody else. <laughs> the conf- Anyway, aren't you glad I went to the University of Alabama? Praise the Lord. Roll Tide. The confirmation. Notice what the, the, these are. This is the chapter themes. I, really, seriously. No, the Lord gave me this, not the University of Alabama. The confirmation of Jesus' resurrection is chapter 1. Then chapter 2, you see the Holy Spirit within us. Then chapter 3, we have authority. Everybody say authority. We're going to get to that in just a second. Then we have boldness in chapter 4. Then chapter 5, it starts this, what I call the doorway. of You start seeing these supernatural things happening. And from Acts 6 all the way to the end, there are 28 chapters in the book of Acts, you see this pattern of what? The acts of the Holy Spirit through God's people. Isn't that awesome? I'm telling you what, it has a beautiful... It's, and again, being a musician, you know, I know our guys play with the click track. And, you know, I, I fuss all the time because I think sometimes it's such bondage to me. Uh, the click track keeps you, keeps you in rhythm and it keeps you precise on, on where you should be and where you should start. But some of the greatest pieces of music uh, are, are played live and not necessarily held to a click track because you have the freedom of expression. And uh, sometimes you get so bound to playing in a structure, especially when you're in a recording studio, you have to use a click track. There's no freedom of expression. I think the beautiful thing about when you take the, the restrictions off a situation like I'm seeing in the book of Acts, you begin to see how God uses he, it's just so awesome how he does things. It's beautiful. I see the book of Acts like I see music sometimes. Some of the greatest songs I've ever seen written uh, were, were just inspired out of nowhere. I mean, that just happened. And in the book of Acts, God is very structured and all that, but he gives us a glimpse of himself when he shows us in chapter 5 that he wants to shift the Holy Spirit from being seen on people and just a special group of people that we identify as the apostles to ordinary people doing ordinary things, but they're, get, they're being done in a super ordinary way. I just think that's awesome. I don't know about you. I think that uh, Jesus is not only an awesome Savior, but he is an awesome he just set this thing up in such a beautiful way. Turn to the book of Acts chapter 1. Let me, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm struggling up here to try to express how beautiful it is to me. And the reason I was comparing it to music, because music sometimes when you get in an atmosphere, uh, there's been times that I've played music where it's just awesome, the, the, the synergy uh, between the individuals playing. I was in a three-piece band. Uh, this is right prior to getting saved, but it really drew me into to. To, to come into the Lord, that there was such a synergy between the two guys and our playing. I mean, we could almost read one another. And you get into that, what I call that supernatural realm of music, and it's the same as you tap into the supernatural realm of God. It's just something about God's presence, the way he does things, how beautiful he is, the peace of it. It's just awesome. And Jesus here, before he, res- he's, he, does his, before he ascends, he says this in Acts chapter 1. He says, being assembled together with him, he commanded him not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. This is verse 4 of Acts 1. He said, you have heard from me, John truly baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized. Everybody say baptized. 
baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Now, notice what it says right here. He's talking about this filling of the Holy Spirit. You say, is this the rebirth, Pastor Brian? No, it's not the rebirth. This is a filling with the Holy Spirit. Now, watch what happens here. They say in verse number uh, 6, they distracted him. Therefore, when they had come, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, what will be... what?" Lord, when will you restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto him, It's not the time nor seasons, for the Father has put in his own heart. Then he goes back. Notice what they tried to distract him from this question. Then Jesus comes back and says, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses. These are Jesus' last words. And to me, Jesus is the most awesome leader that has ever graced this earth. And if his last words were this, that means it's very important, is it not? And so many people take this baptism of the Holy Spirit, they take this filling of the Holy Spirit, and they set it aside because a lot of religious churches and institutions do not embrace it, do not understand it, and they think that it's charismatic or Pentecostal foolishness, and I understand that. There's been a lot of confusion in this area. There's been a lot of problems in this area. I traveled before I founded this church to 316 churches across this nation, and I can tell you there is a lot of confusion about this one issue. Healing is a major confusing issue among some, but I think the baptism of the Holy Spirit probably tops all, in my opinion, because people do not understand it, and a lot of churches actually preach against it, and it's a supernatural experience. As a matter of fact, look what, it's, look what it says over in Acts chapter 2. This is the day of Pentecost, and this is probably one of the most misunderstood verses of Scripture about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Look what it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It said, when the day of Pentecost, this is the day that Jesus said for you to wait, and this is going to happen to you. Notice the day of Pentecost, when, when it has come, you'll be in one accord in one place, and then suddenly there came from heaven the rushing of a mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And verse number 3, there appeared to them these tongues of fire. And I tell you what, that'd be awesome. Awesome, is it not? <laughs> you see that? I, I, I don't know about you. That would probably make the hair on the back of my neck stand out. Anyway, it said there appeared to them these tongues of fire, and it sat upon each one of them. Okay, so check out what's happening. And then num number verse number four, it says they were filled. Everybody say fill. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak, it says, with tongues. They began to pray in the Holy Spirit. There was a supernatural language released at that time. And this is what, notice this is the key to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God gave them utterance. Not it was syllables that they were saying out of their mouths. It was a prayer language. It was a way, as it says in 1 Corinthians 14, of divinely communicating with God. And again, this has been so misunderstood, so misrepresented. And I understand it, I really do. But Jesus' last commandment was receiving the Holy Spirit. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is for power. It's a separate experience. When I was born again on October the 16th, 1983, I received the Lord, but it was two weeks later, and a little booklet that I had received in my desk drawer that um, was written by a mentor, a man that I deeply respect and admire, and uh, he had he'd made an influence on my life during that two-week period of time through his television ministry, and I read that booklet, and I prayed that prayer at that dorm there at the Jacksonville State University all by myself, and the Spirit of God did this. He filled me, and then the Holy Spirit began to rise up through me and gave me utterance, and I started praying this supernatural language, and it changed my life. It changed my life. It so impacted my life that day that I went down to the music hall, and I was on my way to practice drums and get ready for classes as a music major, and people saw me coming into the hallway, and there was a guy that was practicing in a room across the hallway, and he said, all of a sudden, I'm practicing, and he says, I see this big ball of light coming down the hallway, and it goes past my room. We were, they had these uh, rooms with the glass, little glass door on it. Anyway, down this hallway, there's all these practice rooms where musicians would get inside of and uh, in practice, except for drummers, we had to go upstairs because our instruments couldn't fit in those rooms. And so he said, all of a sudden, this ball of light, he opens the door and looks down the hallway, and it was me. 
And by the way, I had, nor, had red hair then, had a lot of it, but it wasn't the red hair that was glowing, okay? It was the Lord. It was this filling of the Holy Spirit. Now, did, my Baptist church did not tell me this was going to happen to me. I didn't understand what happened to me. All I know is it happened to me. And when it happened to me, it affected me. It changed my life. It did something to me that I can't explain. And it wasn't weird. It wasn't wacky. All I know is that, you know what? I have been, this presence of God came upon me, and I'm now praying in this supernatural language. And one of my dearest friends who is a music major, I'm talking about this man could sing like Luther Vandross. And uh, he, he was, he was, he befriended me. That very week, and then he invited me to a prayer meeting in his room up on the, I was on the second floor, he was on the third floor of our dorm, and we prayed that night, and I'm telling you what, I was praying in this language, and it's just the presence of God was so real to me, so alive to me, and it wasn't, we weren't drawing attention to ourselves, it was just this prayer of edification, this prayer of power, and I began a different Brian Jacobs. I was no longer just a Christian, I was a witness. And so when I went into the music hall, I witnessed. I witnessed to my teachers. I witnessed to everyone. And it was just, it was a change in me. It was no longer, and by the way, the things I was dealing with, uh, you know, as far as the flesh and desires and things, there was a power, Jerry, that came upon me. And uh, it, it helped me. I mean, it helped me. The Bible came alive to me. I mean, you know, again, here I am, you know, just a young 21-year-old guy, and all this is happening to me, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm no longer, you know, loving this instrument, even though I still, I play every day. This is a great instrument. I, I'm so thankful for a church that has the, a worship team like we have with such quality people that love the Lord first and, then, and are excellent players and singers and, and really desire not to be up here performing I mean, you know, if you're going to perform, this is the last church you want to be in because I don't want you performing. You can go to another church and perform. You know, we're here to worship the Lord. And uh, my point with all that is that on that day, my life transformed. And that's, to me, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, I realize, again, a lot of people make fun of it. I know a lot of people, you know, mock praying in tongues. I know a lot of people don't understand it. But listen, if you want me to help you with it, others will help you with it. We have people in our church that pray this way every single day. There are people that, that, are, that express the same thing with, with, that I do that I don't know how I would make it, nothing, that nothing, even though Jesus is Lord of my life, but praying in the Holy Spirit every day brings peace, brings power, it brings help. When I don't understand things, when I don't know what's going on, the Spirit of God praying through me prays the perfect will of God. And I don't know about you, thank God for praying God's Word. However, there is a boldness and there's a power, everybody say power, that comes upon you when you release this prayer language. Anyway, that, I just again, we'll talk more about that later, but that's where I want you to see. And as you read Acts chapter 2, look what happened to these people after they received the Holy Spirit. Where did they come? Where, they went from being insecure, weak-minded people to what? Strong men, strong women, did they not? I mean, you read this book and you think, wow. And then I hear people at the seminaries and all the places of higher institution tell me, well, they were a special group of people. God loved them more than he loves you and I. That's just not true, is it? How, why would God love one group and, not, and, and, and treat them special compared to you and I? I don't think that's right. Do you? I think that God's a respecter of persons. So you're telling me he loves the 12 apostles more than he does you and I. Is that true? That he gives them, well, they were special. Well, yeah, they were special. You know, listen, I like to say it like this. They brought Jesus' ministry back into the earth as far as carrying it. You and I... Maybe it could be the generation that brings him from heaven to here. That's the way I look at it, you know. <laughs> I grew up at the University of Alabama, and uh, I've always heard this from Bear Bryant and Coach Nick Saban. It's not how you start a game, but it's how you play in the third and fourth quarter. That's how you win a football game. Is it not true? And, you know, it's the same with life. Hey, they may have started it, but you and I are in the fourth quarter, are we not? And we get to be the ones that win the ring at the end. Hey, I'm just just pointing it out the way I see it, okay? I mean, thank God for the Apostle Paul, but you know what? Jesus loves me just as he loves the Apostle, much as he loves Apostle Paul. As a matter of fact, I've got more responsibility than the Apostle Paul. How dare you say that, Pastor Brian? How dare you say that? What do you mean? 
I, this technology, this technology gives me the ability to speak to more people than Paul did. Do you know that? This technology and the church movement that's right now happening across the world, we have the ability to reach more people than all these disciples did. And I think that's the beautiful thing, of the power of the Holy Spirit, the boldness. And again, these are things I want you to see. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Let me show you something here. And uh, again, thank you for letting me be transparent here and share my story. Acts chapter 3, verse 1. Now notice in Acts 1 and 2, you see what was happening here. Then in Acts chapter 3, this is what's powerful here. They, the first miracle that they did out of the book of Acts was what? It was a healing miracle. And I think that's so important for us to know. And notice what it says in, in Acts 3.1. It says this. Now, Peter and John together, this is after the filling of the Holy Spirit, this is after the day of Pentecost, and after, they, after Peter had delivered his great message here in Acts chapter 2. Notice what it says in Acts 3.1. Now, John and, now, Peter and John went up together to, in the temple, the hour of prayer, for the ninth hour. And a certain man, lamed from his mother's womb, notice this, was carried and lay daily, at the beautiful, lay daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful. Now, notice, this man has been in this situation since birth. That's a long time, is it not? I mean, t- I mean that's terrible. And he knows what he says here. He's asking for alms or asking for help for all those who went in the temple. And then in verse 3, seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple or in the church, he asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on, on Peter and John, he said, notice what he says, fixing his eyes on with Peter and John said, look at us. And so he gave attention. This is what they said to him. And he gave attention expecting to receive something from them. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I have I give you. Now, again, this, I, I, Peter may have had, I don't know, he just, I guess he didn't carry his wallet, I don't know. It doesn't really matter here. The point is, he said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I give you, he says, in the name of Jesus Christ, notice this, rise and walk. And look what he did. He did not just pray for him. I love what he did here in verse number uh, 7. He took him by the right hand and he lifted it up, okay? Now, just think about this for a second, okay? They had been they had been in the temple before. They had seen this guy. He'd been there all his life, okay? They said he'd been there since birth. He was apparently at least over 25 years old, at least. And so Peter, what does he do? He reaches out to him and takes him by his right hand. Isn't that awesome? That's the act of faith. That's saying, notice what he says here. I like what he says. It, look what he says. And Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. What he's trying to say, listen, money is not what you need right now. This is what you need. He said, in the name of Jesus. And everybody say, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What did he say? He said, go to the doctor, go to the hospital. Nothing wrong with that. What did he say? Let's say it together. Rise up and walk. Come on, one more time. Rise up and walk. What, did he, what happened here? Look what it says here. And it says in verse 8, so he, leaping up, stood and walked. This guy had walked all his life, and now all of a sudden he's what? He's walking, leaping, and praising God. Isn't that awesome? How did it happen, Pastor Brian? How did this happen? It all happened in what name? The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, ladies and gentlemen, is not the prayer, the name you use at the end of the prayer. It's not a word that flies out of your mouth when you hit your hand with a, when you hit your hand with a hammer, okay, which some people do. No, the name of Jesus is for authority and for power, is it not? Is it not? Look what it says right here. And so in verse 8, so leaping, he stood up, walked, and entered in the temple, walking, leaping, and praising God. And look at verse 9, and all the people saw him walking and praising God. Wouldn't that, wouldn't that be a pretty big testimony to you and I? This person you'd seen every time you went to church, let's say we were in this big, massive church, and this guy was always out front asking for money, and people gave him money. Then all of a sudden, you're coming down the hallway, coming into church, and then here comes this guy past you, the same guy was out there before. And wouldn't that do something to you? I don't know about you. It'd freak me out for a minute. But then all of a sudden, look what it says. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They knew who he was. And wonder and amazement happened to them. They began to praise God because God is good. Jesus is Lord. And they knew that the healing Savior that they heard about that did all these miracles before is still doing these miracles. But guess who he's doing these miracles through? His men. His people. You say, well, Pastor Brian, that was great for then and now. That, but let me tell you something. That's not passed away. That belongs to you and I. 
That name of Jesus belongs to you and I. You say, Pastor Brian, can you prove it? Yes, I can. Look at verse number 16. Verse number 16. And this is where Peter was explaining. Peter goes back to preaching in verse 11 and through 15, and I don't have time. And he talks about basically what they had did to Jesus by crucifying him, this innocent man, as Peter calls him, and he became the resurrected Savior. And he says in verse number 16, and his name, remember, let's read verse 16 together. Come on with me out loud. I like Gomer Powell and Sergeant Carter. I can't hear you now. Here we go. One, two. I love Sergeant Carter, Gomer Powell. That is my favorite program. I mean, I realized I was, I was born in the same hospital as Gomer Powell. But anyway, Shazam. Anyway, I love Sergeant Carter because he's always in his face. Anyway, (laughs) and anyway, listen, this is what it says here. Let's say it together. And his name through faith, I can't hear you. Now, here we go. And his name through faith in his name has made this man strong whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given them this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Let's read it one more time. And his name through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Isn't that powerful? What is it? It's his name. Faith in his name. And faith in his name has given this man soundness. And faith in the name of Jesus gives you soundness. When you have faith, what is faith? Well, let's just, again, I'm going to sidetrack for a second just for, and they can help me back there on the screens or just one verse of scripture, Hebrews eleven six. Hebrews eleven six. Let's just go there. Just one quick brief moment, even though we teach it a lot. Hebrews eleven six. what does it say? It says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. You must come to God believing that he is and that he is a rewarder. Everybody say rewarder. He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Hebrews eleven six. One more time. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. But let's flip that around. With faith, it's possible to please him. And when you get to that, listen, your responsibility is not doing. Your responsibility is believing and receiving. Do you know that? So many people try to work their way into getting God to do something. Yes, there's prayer, there's believing, there's declaring the word of God. But notice faith in the name of Jesus. Faith in believing that whatever you're going through, I'm going to trust the Lord. Then notice what it says here. I believe that God is who he is. And if he, if he is who he is, then is the song we sang earlier. By the way, wasn't that last song we sang awesome? All the songs are good. I, I think Jonathan did an excellent job of picking songs here. But that last song, the lyrics, whoever wrote those lyrics, I'd like to write lyrics like that, wouldn't y'all? I'm telling you what, he is bigger than I thought he was. I'm telling you what. And when you get to a place, regardless of your mistakes, your flesh, your foolishness, your stupidity, and you realize how big he is and that he rewards those who believe how big he is, and you're facing a situation where it is bigger than you, as Michelle was up here, she was preaching. That woman, I tell you what, Michelle Pierce, she's a little preacher, is she not? Well, she's just a tiny package of, of good preaching. Oh, listen, we've got great ministers and great men and women of God in this church that I am so I hate to say proud of because I don't like to use that word proud of, but I'm so thankful for that people that love God, that believe him. And you know what God does with those people that believe him? He rewards them. You said, Pastor Brian, I need some rewards right now. My life's just whatever. Listen, you just keep pressing on. You keep believing. I mean, just think about that guy. He kept going to the temple. He, I guess he was about 25 to 30 years old. He kept going to the temple. Then on one Sunday morning day, it all changed. One Sunday morning, everybody say one Sunday morning. One Sunday morning, it all changed for him. And you know, your Sunday morning could be this Sunday morning where it all changed for you. But you've got to be a what? A person who believes, what does it say? It comes to God and must believe that he is. What are you facing today? What are you facing today? If you believe that God is bigger than that situation, and as you seek him, I promise you, you'll be rewarded in that situation. Sometimes, even though battles, there come, and they, you think, man, this thing is wearing me down and wearing me out. Listen, there is a place, I believe, in God that if you keep pressing through, you're going to win that victory if you trust him. A lot of people give up in the fourth quarter of life. They really do. And don't press in. Listen, you say, well, I, man, I made this terrible mistake. I put myself in this compromising position, or I did this, or I did that. Hey, listen, don't run from God. Run to him. 
that you listen, he, he's not, he's not, you know, this, this deal of the, the whole book of Acts is about God wanting to be on the inside of you and I and work through us because he loves us and he wants to be close to us. He's not trying to punish you. He's not trying to, you know, listen, I know you get your flesh out of whack and you can do all kinds of stupid things you shouldn't do, but that doesn't mean he doesn't love you. And, you know, listen, there also is your own consciousness. I saw a movie the other day about this lady. Well, it's the Downton Abbey series. I don't know. We're watching it again, and it's so silly, okay? I don't know. How many of you ever watched that series? All right. Some of you, some of you, I'll get some of you raising two hands. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I mean, you know, it's just, anyway, I, I tried to get Sheila to call me Lord Brian, but that's just not working in my house. <laughs> I thought that's funny whether you did or not. Anyway, you got to see the whole series. You know how they call him Lord this and Lord that. Anyway, I'm just joking. She's not going to be calling me Lord, okay? But anyway, my point with all that is, is simply this, as I get this new microphone adjusted on me, is that all this ritual formality and all these things that we go through, we think that God is, you know, untouchable and, and he's out to get us. Listen, if God wanted to get you, he'd already got you by now, okay? As far as, you know, wanting to do something to you. Listen, my children can frustrate me, but I don't stand at the door with an AK-47 and threaten to kill them, okay? Yeah, they make mistakes. Yes, they do things they want to do. I mean, I listen, I frustrated my parents. We all frustrated, you know, each other. And, but that don't mean, you know, again, I don't love them. I love them unconditionally. Yes, I see things. Hey, I was 18 one time. I was 19. I was 20. I was 25. I did this. I did that. And, you know, I understand that. But at the same time, I know that my father's love, that as I seek him, he rewards me coming to him and not running from him. Hmm. I don't know. Somebody need to hear that. Hey, let's get, I need to wrap this up with this just for right now. Let's go to uh, the, the thing that I want to talk about, this faith in the name of Jesus. But in, Ma- in Matthew chapter 28, the last thing I want to share with you is Jesus' last words are recorded in Acts, but he had some commandments here in Matthew chapter 28. Jesus has given you and I authority in, in, in his name. And notice what it says here in Acts, uh, not, not in Acts. Let me get this thing straight here. We're trying this new mic. So anyway, in Matthew chapter 28, notice what it says in verse number uh, 16. Matthew 28, 16. This is called the Great Commission, but it's been, to me in my terminology, it's been the Great Omission. Because it says right here, the 11 disciples went away to Galilee, this mountain where Jesus appointed for them. And when they saw him and they worshiped him, but some doubted. Can, Can you imagine that for a second? You're seeing Jesus who is resurrected, from the dead, you knew that he died, and yet you doubt. I, now, that, that to me is, that's some stubborn faith. I mean, that's some stubborn unbelief, is it not? I mean, you and I, is there anybody in this auditorium watching you raise your hand that's ever seen Jesus personally? I haven't. I've, I've heard his voice. I know him through his word. And yet we believe, okay, look how much great faith you have. You think you don't have any, but you're here today because you, you believe in somebody you have not seen. Isn't that true? Uh, isn't, that, isn't that awesome? I mean, you do have faith. And yet some people that actually saw him, I just thought that was interesting as I was studying that. It said some doubt. And I'm like, how could you doubt? Anyway, in verse number 18, this is my point. And Jesus came and he spoke to them. And what did he say? Everybody, let's say it together. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Notice this phrase. And then the next verse is this, verse 19. What's that first word? One more time. So let's go back to verse number uh, 18 again, please. And Jesus said and said, all authority has been given in heaven to me. Excuse me. All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And then what he says in verse 19, I mean, what's the next word? Go. I think a lot of people that means stay. (laughs) No, what does he mean? He says, you go, you take my authority, you take this power and you do something with it. Isn't that not the way you see it? I see it like that. He says, go there, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Notice verse number 20. It says this, teaching them, everybody say teaching them, teaching to observe all things I've commanded you. What did he command us in Acts chapter 1? To receive the Holy Spirit. And he says, know that I am with you even to the end of the age. Isn't that awesome? What is he saying to you and I? He's saying, listen, I've given you the authority. I've given you the power. I've given you the person, the Holy Spirit. Now you are to go, not hide. You are to aggressively attack, not run from. Okay? 
And I think that's the beauty of what we as believers are supposed to do in Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16, here's the same commission. And I'm going to close it with this, basically. Mark chapter 16. By the way, a lot of scholars say that Mark chapter 16 was uh, added, and I don't believe it was. Everything that's confirmed in Mark chapter 16 has been taught throughout the rest of the scriptures. So anyway, for all those theologians that say it was added to the end, I'm like, no, it was not at the end because these very things were done. But notice again, verse 14 it says, they appeared to the 11 and he sat at the table and look what Jesus did in verse 14. Watch this now. What did he do in Mark chapter 16, verse number uh, 14? Notice what he says. Well, you'll get that in just a second. Mark 16, 14. He said, he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart. What was the main thing Jesus had to deal with that he did not like? Unbelief. Notice in all these three times that I've read to you, he keeps coming against what? Unbelief, not believing. That's the only thing you've got to do is believe. P- believe and put your doubts aside. You say, Pastor Brian, I don't understand everything you're talking about. Some of the stuff you're talking about is way over my head. Listen, just believe it. Notice what it says here. Thank you. Verse 14, later he appeared to the 11 as they sat at the table and he rebuked their unbelief. Notice this. And their hardness of heart. I call it religiosity because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. Notice verse 15. Where's this word again I like here? And what's this next word? Jesus said to them, what? Go. Go. He said it again. Two times Jesus has used this word go. So if he says go twice, what's that mean we're supposed to do? Good. You are college graduates. How about that? You have graduated from Metroplex Family Church University Incorporated. (laughs) Seriously. We're not supposed to sit. We're not supposed to be. It says, go into all the world. You say, Pastor Brian, am I supposed to go to Africa? No, but you can go next door to uh, Cleburne, could you not? (laughs) Okay. You can go and do your part where you are. And what does it say? What does it say? Preach the gospel to every creature, every person, dog, cat, bird, stay away from the snakes, but you can preach the gospel to every person. And I'm telling you what, notice what it says here in verse, it continues on in verse number uh, 16 and says, and it, watch this, he says, and he who believes, watch that word again, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. He who does not believe will be condemned. Notice verse 17, here we go. Verse number 17 states this, and says, these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons or have authority over the devil. They will pray in this supernatural language. Verse number 18. They will take up serpents. Again, that's not for you to necessarily go out and go snake hunting. That means you have authority over the enemy. You have authority over your adversary. And that says right here, if you drink any deadly thing, not purposefully, but by accident, it says it won't hurt you. I don't know about you, when I went to Africa one time for 30 days, I practiced this verse of scripture greatly. I stood on this verse of scripture 37 days in a row. And I, even though I had to drink bottled water and all those things, I said, nothing, nothing that I eat or drink or hurt me, and it didn't. And the rest of my crew got sick with whatever. Isn't that amazing? If you just apply God's word. And I choose to believe this, that when you lay hands on the sick, they will recover. I believe in this. And this is not, again, my authority. It's in whose authority? Everybody say his name. Jesus. And notice what it says here in verse 19. After the Lord had spoken to them, he was ascended into heaven. He sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out, preached everywhere. The Lord working with them, confirming this word with accompanying signs. Ladies and gentlemen, that generation was empowered and you and I are empowered. Listen, even if it comes to you, say, well, Pastor Brian, they didn't do what we did. They don't have the life that we live. Listen, their life was different. You know what? It was harder. You and I have this technology. We have cars. We have Starbucks. We have all the things that we have that make life pleasurable. We have the internet. We have these things. Yet these people had simplicity of faith, and they dared to believe God when the religious persecution was higher in this book than it is right now. I know that you don't like what's happening in Washington. I know you don't like this and like that. It's what you see on Facebook. But let me tell you something. Bottom line, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and he wants to live what he did then through them and us today. And I will not back off that, not back away from that. I don't care what collapses in my life as far as problems and pressures. Listen, you just fight through it. I am a student of military history. And great men war, won great battles because they did one thing. They never quit. They never quit. They never gave up. They never gave up. 
even though they didn't understand it. My two uncles landed on Iwo Jima. One was carried a machine gun. I'm talking about those machine guns that probably weighed as much as I did. And the other one was an ammunition carrier. And even though they didn't tell me a lot about their stories because they didn't want to talk about it, and I wish I'd have talked to them about it more. However, one thing I admired about those two men, they didn't understand their enemy. Their enemy was aggressive. No one told them that the Japanese were that militant and that aggressive and would kill themselves to kill you. But they knew in that first hour of the Battle of Iwo Jima, they had one decision to make. And that was this. They were going to live and not die. They were going to fight through. And they were going to win. <clears throat> and my uncle, who carried the machine gun, he said, all I know is when I made that decision, when I got, 10 years off, when I got 25 yards off that landing craft and I landed in that sandy, whatever, beady soil there, of that volcanic, whatever that substance is, and I said, I'm trying to dig a hole to you know, bury myself in this gun and the man that's with me and then start this battle. All I know is I made the decision in that hole. I am going to fight to win. I'm not going to die right here. Even though people were dying around him, he said, I'm going to make the decision to live and I'm going to trust in God and I'm going to trust in Jesus. And I, every time I fire this weapon, I'm going to fire it in the name of the Lord. And he did. And I'm telling you what, that was not, he was a, not a theologian. He was not a Bible scholar. He simply loved God and believed God as he is. And you know, you think you have problems today. Can you imagine bullets flying over your head and things blowing up around you physically? That, that'd be a lot, compared to the pressure you're dealing with, that'd be a lot more than you could probably bear and I could bear. But they had a sense that they can do this. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you what, we can make it through these battles. But we got to have the power that's given to you and I. If you try to do it through reason and intellectualism and, you know, you can get all the counseling in the world. But sometimes you just got to take your Bible and sometimes you got to say, God, I ask you for the Holy Spirit to come inside me, to pray through me and release your will in my life. And I guarantee you he'll do just that. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We thank you so much for your peace, your presence, your power, your provision. I pray over every person right now to, to have that stirring inside of them, to want everything that you have for them, to desire everything that you've been able to give them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's all say this together. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you so much for giving me eternal life through you. I thank you so much for purchasing my soul and making me whole as I trust you. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. I welcome you, Holy Spirit. Be a part of my life. Pray through me the perfect will of God. I receive you now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And in Jesus' name, if there's anything in my life, if there's anything in my life that hinders my relationship with you, I let it go. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, if you made that decision, if you say, Holy Spirit, every day I welcome you, I'm telling you, will you seek this intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit? You seek this relationship with the Lord. I promise you, He'll take you places you never dreamed you could go. You can do things you never thought you could do. It's amazing to me how God favors you and it wants to help you in every area of your life if you'll trust Him. Recently, I, I, you know, over the last year, there's some drummer friends that I are mentors that I've always wanted to communicate with and contact with, and, and some of them I have. And uh, even though one of my greatest mentors passed away, it's amazing how close I am to his own family now. It just amazes me. It amazes me. And uh, over the last week, there's a drummer friend, not a friend, but a mentor friend, and I've been watching, well, two of them on Facebook, two great, great drummers, very, very famous bands of the 80s, and they're still, they're still playing today, and we'll be playing this summer as they tour Anyway, I've, I made some comments on Facebook to them, and sure enough, they reached back out to me and made comments to me, and we've had an exchange. And um, all I know is 
I didn't honor God when I was a young man playing the drums. But I've chosen to honor him, of course, after I got saved and still and played in Christian music and all that. And even to this day, I have a vested interest in helping my children. I want to make sure their musical skills are at the very best, especially as I endeavor to encourage Allison Benjamin. Um, he has a really natural way of playing, and I'm thankful for that. And, of course, I work with Samuel uh, constantly every week with him playing. And then I'll be training my dog Pinkerton. He's going to be the first dog drummer in America. <laughs> just kid, just kid. My point with all that is, is if I could get him to do it, I would. First of all, I got to get him to be obedient about certain things. But anyway, my point with all that is, you know, when you make things right with God, over a time, he makes things right with you. He brings you into a place and dreams and desires that, you know, you can't, you can't fathom how the Lord will restore things back to you when you give it to him. And I gave him that instrument. I gave it. And I realized this, I'm 58 years ago, 58 years old. This was, you know, this was a long time ago that I, you know, made this conversion and all that. But I'm telling you, even now, even this week, it's amazing. It's amazing to me how God, if you give him your life, if you give him lordship, if you surrender and, you know, be led of the Holy Spirit, you know, I mean, I want you to know the comments I made on Facebook to these men were not, I made comments that were not the average person. There were things that I felt led to and it got their attention and they responded back. And my point with all that is the Lord led me to do that. You say, well, Pastor Brown, what's that have to do with me? I'm just telling you, God is awesome. When you give him your life, when you surrender to him, he makes everything right. Even if it takes years and years and years and years to do. I'm talking about years. If you'll give it to him, eventually things come around. Things will work out. Things will come together. As a matter of fact, we quote that verse of Scripture, all things work together for the good of those who love God. That's, sort of, that's taken out of context, even though I know what people are saying there. You know, things work out for the good because you trust God and you pray through in the Holy Spirit. You know, Dave and Shelby had some challenges like us all recently. But, you know, they prayed through it the best way they knew how. I know this couple. Listen, they had to believe God for their kids. They had to believe God for the house. They had to believe God for their bodies. Got to believe God for this. Got to believe God for that. But they just got to believe God. I guess you, I know that they would rather believe God than quit. You know? She had to believe God to marry Dave. <laughs> and it worked out, didn't it not, Shelby? <laughs> and Dave did. <laughs> Dave did like that. No, it worked out really good. You know? I saw their wedding pictures. And even though they were happy in all this that day, but there was a factor of the unknown. Here's this guy, and here is I. It's Shelby's perspective. Here's this guy named Dave. But you know what? In her post recently, I saw this. You know, I saw this thankfulness for this man. She didn't know that day. But the more she got to know him, the better she appreciated that she trusted God, right? You shared that testimony here. I'm not sharing anything you haven't shared before. You've shared that right here on Wednesday nights as well as Sundays and day two and all that we've shared. You know why? Because God's worthy of being trusted. You can live your own life. You can trust yourself. But I'd rather trust God. I'd rather trust God. I have a dear friend of mine that's speaking and mentoring and, and really spending some time with Mr. Trump. You may not like Mr. Trump, and he has his problems, and so we all have our problems. But he's actually helping him spiritually to, to look at his personality, to look at some things differently. You know, what happened what, is what happened. So we got to go forward. But my friend was telling me, as a dear man that's mentored five presidents, or this is the fourth one plus one's five. He said, you know, he's just looking at things differently. He's calmer about his approach. He thinks before he speaks. And, you know, he's just saying, I can't change what happened. What happens, what happened. I like, he said, I got to look forward. And I got to go for it. I'm 72 years old. This is what he told Doug. He said, I'm just going to go for it and keep moving forward the best way I know how. Know how. I'm a public figure. All my life is before people. I've made mistakes. I've tried my best. I've done what I thought was right and sincere. And yes, I have not done what people wanted me to do and people hate me. But my heart is pure and I want to do what's right. And I'm going to do what's right. And I'm going to grow and be a better man. And you know, I, what a What a heart. You say, well, I don't, I don't like him. Whatever. Well, I don't, you know, listen, I don't care who it is. Anybody with that attitude, well, God will honor. 
whether it's him or somebody down the street, your next door neighbor. Listen, you put a heart towards God. You put one step towards him and embrace the power, the authority in Jesus' name like these people did. I promise you, your life will get better. Now, it may not look better. It may not feel better at the moment. It may be going actually the opposite direction, okay? But it will get better when you trust him. I'm guaranteeing you. When Shelby walked through that door today, trusting him was written all over her face through one of her very challenging situations they've been through the last couple weeks, as well as moving. But you know what? Look at her today. And look at him. They're here. Look at you. Look at you. Some of you have been through the hardest times of your life. And by the way, I enjoy Facebook, not sometimes with all the stuff I see, but sometimes in following y'all's life's journey and praying for you, I see your posts. I see your frustrations. Of course, I don't want to see everything that you've eaten. (laughs) But anyway, but I see where you've been. I see what you've gone through. And some of you don't really realize sometimes how far you've really gone and how you've made it if it weren't for trusting God. That you put your trust, you, listen, some of you been down some roads, you didn't, the headlights were off and you felt like the engine was light. The engine was off because you didn't know, and there was no steering. You didn't know how you were going to get there, but you did. And look where you are today. And I tell you what, he's worthy of trusting. And so I, I just wrapping it up with this. I just want you to give it to him, whatever you're facing right now. Maybe it's healing in your body. Maybe you don't understand it. Well, you go to your doctor, you take that medication, you do what you got to do. But I promise you, give that five or 10 minutes to take this technology. And as Dave and I have teached and taught for hours and hours and hours, and we will, you Google healing scriptures, Dave. Will they not come up by the hundreds healing scriptures and you read those or go read the book of Acts and know that your Savior, your Lord, is not only cares about your salvation, but he cares about your body. You say, well, Pastor Ron, I prayed it didn't happen. Don't give up. Don't give up. If you got to take the medicine and speak the name of Jesus, do that. If you got to go find you another doctor or, or whatever situation, you keep pressing and you keep pressing and you keep moving forward. And I guarantee you that mountain has to crumble, not in your name, but his. So Robert, I think you're closing this service. So come on up. How does that make sense to y'all? It makes sense to me. And so thank you for being here. Thank y'all for joining. If we can be of any, any help to you in the prayer of agreement, especially the prayer of healing, please, please let me know, okay? Jesus is still in the healing business. He is still a healer, Robert. He still, a maker. He still makes people whole. And he still helps people. And I'm so thankful that he does. And he does it by faith. And not by emotions, not by pleading, not by begging, but by believing in Jesus' name. Thank you, sir. quiet time uh, one morning and I was just driving and in that prayer the Lord's prayer uh, your will be done I got to that point in that spot and I'm just thinking your will be done and we don't have to convince anybody that it looks like Satan's doing his best to, to wreck the world he, his hand is being busy and if you have any adm- admiration for Satan it would be that he is diligent he works hard he works hard at what he does and I was thinking about the Lord's will be done. Sometimes we get this uh, perception of God just sitting up there on the throne who's already done it, and we preach that. Jesus has already made the provisions. The victory has already been won. But he just sits up there waiting for our prompting. And that, he told me that morning, that's not right, Robert. That's not right. I have a will. Jesus said that he will build his church And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Will not. That means he's going to be using us. And what better time than right now? That we have a plan and a goal. And it made me think, my father-in-law is in the room and he was around. I think he got close to the Lord. I think he was saved, but he got close to the Lord back in the 70s when the hippie movement was going. And then there was also the Jesus movement. We don't hear very much about that, but it was real. It happened. And he grew, grew very close to the Lord during that time. And he tells stories of what went happened during that time. Things that the Lord prompted him to do or say or, or, or be a part of. And it was just an intimacy he had with the Lord. It was through the Holy Spirit, what we've been talking about this morning. And I listened to those stories and I said, what a joy. 
It's enviable. It's like, I want to be a part of that. I want to have the Lord use me in that manner. Just wonderful stories about God just used ordinary people just like us. I knew the people he spoke of, and they're not holy rollers like, boy, they're just walking with Jesus every moment. I see the flaws in them. I see the flaws. And God would use them and say, God, that is awesome. Well, I want to encourage all of us. I want to challenge all of us right now. What a better time than now where there's a world just hurting that needs Jesus bad, bad. And he's doing it. We hear stories of church in China. There are brothers and sisters in the Lord that are enveloped with his love and they will not sell it for anything. They will not. So that church is growing that Jesus talked about. Let's not miss it. Where we're at, right here in Burleson, there's people that need that. And we've got that treasure in this earthen vessel. Well, I'm done preaching. Announcements. Ladies meetings tomorrow evening here at the church, 630. I encourage all the ladies. It's a wonderful time of fellowship and and work. And, Bible teaching. My sister Sheila teaches that. So if you have not availed yourself to that, I would challenge you and encourage you at least try it. Okay. It's, it's, it's one of the best things we do around here. Uh, and the other thing is our guests. I see some new faces and want to thank you all just for being a part of it, our church this morning. Encourage you to come back. If you're just visiting family, completely understand. But if you're looking for a church or, or, or a place to call home, welcome join us. Make it your place too. We are family church and we mean that. And then giving. We have the giving box in the back and the kiosk and and, uh, and text to give all those options. And just like David McDonald says, hey, it's real easy. But when you do it, make sure that is something tangible you can put in front of the Lord and say, you are my source. You are my God. I am going to worship you in something I can touch and make something meaningful. I'm telling you, it will change your, it will change you when you have that approach. So, um, Pastor already prayed us out. I enjoy your sad or Sunday. Enjoy your Sunday and have a good blessed week. We'll see y'all again. Y'all are dismissed.